So it is Palm Sunday, the day a triumphal entry uh, took place, and, and Luke recorded this in Luke chapter 19, beginning at verse 28. It says, when he had said these things at Jesus, he went on ahead, going up to Jerusalem. When he drew near to Bethpage and Bethany, at the mount that is called Olivet, he sent two of his disciples, saying, go into the village in front of you. When on entering, you will find a colt tied, on which no one has ever sat. Untie it and bring it here. If anyone asks you why you're untying it, you shall say this, the Lord has need of it. So those who were sent away and found it just as he told them. And as they were untying the colt, its owner said to them, why are you untying the colt? And they said, the Lord has need of it. And they brought it to Jesus, and throwing their cloaks on the colt, they set Jesus on it. And as he rode along, they spread their cloaks on the road. And we know other gospels tell us that they also put their palm branches on the road, and they waved them. And as he was drawing near, already on the way down to the Mount of Olives, the whole multitude of his disciples began to rejoice and praise God with a loud voice for all the mighty works they had seen in Jesus, saying, Blessed is the King who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest. And some of the Pharisees in the crowd said to him, Teacher, rebuke your disciples. But Jesus answered, I tell you, if they were silent, the very stones would cry out. And so here we are, it's Palm Sunday, uh, we are continuing a sermon series called Fresh Start, because we as disciples of Jesus know that our God is a God of fresh starts, and certainly not just today, but every day. We know that his mercies are new every morning, and God wants to do something new in our hearts and our minds. And every time we gather, right, God calls us to repentance, right, and that's where a fresh start happens as God speaks his truth and fills us with his mercies and his Grace not only does that, but he fills us with his spirit. And in the season of Lent, as we look to Jesus, as we get ready not just for the cross and his resurrection, we are reminded that the same spirit that brought Jesus to life lives in us. The spirit was given to us in our baptism when God created faith in us. It lives in us, and God continues to fill us with his spirit. And so today, may he fill us with his spirit as we continue to journey uh, together. Um, So far in this sermon series, Uh, We've looked at some different uh, cities, some different early churches that we have in the Scriptures, the book of Acts, and then the epistles associated to them. We looked at the city of Corinth and saw the fresh start that God was calling the city of Corinth into and also us. We looked at the city of Thessalonica, what God did there and what he's doing in us. We looked at Ephesus, what God did there, what he's doing in us. We looked at Philippi, and we also looked at Rome. And now today, we're going to be going at Jerusalem, the city of Jerusalem, what God was doing there. And the big question is, well, what do we know about Jerusalem? Well, here's some things that we know about Jerusalem. Genesis chapter 22. uh, We see Jerusalem come to uh, the table, this this city. What happened in Genesis chapter 22? Genesis, right, God shows how he created everything, what he's up to, how he loves his world. He shows how sin came into the world and his promise to fix what was broken because of what we did. And as we see the story unfold in history, unfold. We see that God still has a heart for his world. He still has a promise. But then all of a sudden he centers his attention on on one man because he knows the whole world needs to be blessed. It's his creation. And so he he calls a man named Abraham. Calls a man named Abraham into a relationship with him and says, Abraham, I need to bless this whole world. I need to reconcile this whole world. I need to bring the Messiah to this whole world. Abraham, you need to light up this world, you and your descendants. And so he made a promise to a man named Abraham over 2,000 years 4,000 years ago, 2,000 years before Jesus came, before that Palm Sunday, a promise to the man named Abraham that he's going to have descendants. This guy didn't have any kids, but all of a sudden he has a a son. To have descendants, you need children. And he has this son, and all of a sudden God says, Abraham, I need to test you. Do you really believe in me? Do you trust in me? Or are you looking at your own works, your own life in this world? Or are you looking at me? Do you trust me? So what God does In Genesis chapter 22, he says, Abraham, you need to sacrifice your son to me. So he says, Abraham, go to Mount Moriah. Go to this mountain. And there you'll sacrifice your son to me. So Abraham trusts God. He trusts him. He doesn't know what's going to happen here. All he knows is God said to do this. And so he's trusting God by faith. And as he goes to that mountain with his son Isaac, all of a sudden God shows up and says, Abraham, thank you for believing in me. We're going to sacrifice that ram over there, not your son. But right away what we see in this mountain, it's a place of sacrifice. God calls us to make sacrifices. He makes sacrifices. And it was a thousand years after that moment happened with Abraham. Abraham's descendants are still living in this this land, this fertile crescent. And God's saying, light up the world. This is the highway of the Middle East, the highway of the world. You guys need to light up the world as they come and visit you. And you need to go to them. 
And so they're there, and there's a man named King David at that time. And King David, 1,000 B.C., says, I'm going to make the capital here on this mountain, this mountain where Abraham and Isaac were, this place of sacrifice, and not just this mountain, Solomon Son, when you build this temple, this place of sacrifice, this place where the presence of God will be and people will gather, you're going to build it right here where Abraham made that sacrifice of that ram. And since King David and Solomon, right, leading up to Jesus, leading up to that Palm Sunday, Jerusalem was known as a place of sacrifice, where sacrifices would be made over and over and over again until the ultimate sacrifice would be made. And so today, what I want to do is talk about a life of sacrifice as we zero in on Palm Sunday as we consider Jerusalem. A man named Paul in the book of Acts says this, and I love this, Acts chapter 21. Uh, the people are worried about Paul because he's about to go to Jerusalem, but Paul understands sacrifice. He understands sacrifice. He understands what Jesus did for him. And so he says, I am ready to not only be imprisoned in Jerusalem, in Jerusalem, but I'm also ready to die, to give up my life. So a life of sacrifice. Here at Trinity, we talk a lot about faith, hope, and love. As we go at this, we're going to talk about sacrificial faith, sacrificial hope, and sacrificial love. And so sacrificial faith. Sacrificial faith. Right? As soon as that word faith is there, we understand we're looking to Jesus because he's the object of our Faith. We're looking at the one who made the sacrifice, who rode on that donkey on that Palm Sunday beginning Holy Week with his face set like flint on the cross. He knew he entered into Jerusalem to make a sacrifice. For many of us, right, we get that. Jesus made a sacrifice for us. For some of us, we don't understand what he did. Right? He made a sacrifice. He gave up his life for you and for me so that we can be reconciled to God, not just here and now and the present, but for all eternity. He made a way. Our sin separated us, and a sacrifice needed to be made. We needed to be reconciled. There needed to be a payment, and Jesus made that payment for you and for me and our accountability to our Creator so that we can be reconciled to Him. He made the greatest sacrifice of all. If you don't know that, I pray that you know that. I pray you worship with us this week because we're going to get into this quite a bit, not just today. But that Palm Sunday was actually considered Lamb Selection Day. Lamb Selection Day, because the Passover feast, remembering what God did for his children, rescue them out of the hand of bondage and slavery in Egypt. They're getting ready for the Passover, and it's called Lamb Selection Day. And Jesus rides into Jerusalem saying, here I am, the Lamb of God, the sacrifice of God, ready to take away the sins of the world. And so sacrificial faith doesn't just trust in Jesus and receive his sacrifice. Sacrificial faith follows the example of the one who made the sacrifice. So here's what Jesus said. Here's what Jesus said about sacrificial faith. If anyone would come after me, if anyone would follow me, trust in me, have faith in me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. Right? The very essence of faith in Jesus is to live a selfless life, a sacrificial life. Not just to receive it, but to live it out. In the book of Romans, Paul says this, I appeal to you, therefore, brothers and sisters, by the mercies of God, in view of the mercies of God, the fresh start of God, what he did for us on the cross, in view of his mercies, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual act of worship. Sacrificial faith. As I was trying to, to take this in, what sacrificial faith looks like in light of what Jesus has done for you and, and for me, um, I'm thinking about basketball. Many of you know I've been doing basketball illustrations now, it seems like, for a while in the midst of basketball season. But here's what I was thinking about. Um, there's been a couple times with some second graders that I'm coaching, some sixth graders that I'm coaching, where our team might be up by a lot, right? And there's some kids on the team that haven't scored yet, and there's kids that can keep scoring and keep scoring and keep scoring. But there's some kids... Right? They haven't scored yet. And so what does Coach Justin say to the, the young men? Hey, so-and-so hasn't scored yet. Pass it to him. Pass it to him. Right? And what blesses my heart as a coach is when I see these kids who can score a lot, right? all of a sudden they get into a move and they sit up their buddy for success and they throw it to them. And what do they do? They get the assist. Right? They make a sacrificial move. Hey, I could score. I could pat my stats, but I'm going to help someone else out. 
Right? And so my question for you as we consider sacrificial faith is, who can you set up for success? But not just someone, because we're talking about faith, we're not talking about love yet. How can you set Jesus up for success? What sacrificial move can you make in your life where you say, Jesus, it's not about me, it's about you right now. I want to give you an assist. What can you and I do? What sacrificial moves can we make by faith setting up Jesus himself for success? A couple of thoughts that, that I'm having, and maybe this will spur you on, but think about this throughout the day and apply it to your life. Um, one of the things I think that often we do is we tell people we'll pray for them, and that's, that's good, that's great. Please pray for others. But maybe something to get us out of our comfort zone, to surrender ourselves, to be selfless in that moment, trusting that the Spirit of God lives in us. Hey, how about we actually pray together right now? How about I pray for you right now? What does prayer do? When we talk about sacrificial faith, Prayer gets the attention off of me as the helper and you as the helper and the attention to the helper, Jesus. Prayer is an assist, right? Let's pray. Jesus, help them. That's an assist we can do. What if in our lives when, when God calls us into relationships with people and we want to just encourage them, what if instead of us just saying, hey, go get them, you got this, us saying, hey, you did a good job today, or giving them some advice. What if we actually gave them a scripture verse? Right, the scripture verse is we believe that these are Jesus' words, like the Spirit of God. Right, what if we give people Bible verses? What if we text people Bible verses? What if we put Bible verses up around the office, no matter where we work? Little sticky notes, little postcards, little words of encouragement from God Almighty, from Jesus. Right? Sacrificial faith. Right, certainly, in, even in an offering time. Right? Why do we give an offering? Many different reasons, but maybe it's about a sacrificial, faithful offering. Jesus, I'm trying to set you up for success. It's about you, not me. I don't have the words to help people. You have the words to help people. You have the resources. Sacrificial faith. Sacrificial hope. Sacrificial hope. Not just faith, but sacrificial hope. Here's a prophecy that a man named Isaiah spoke centuries before Jesus came and it's as if Jesus himself is speaking this, because this is just God's word. This is how God works, and this is amazing. But here's what Isaiah prophesied about and what we know Jesus spoke and believed. He says, I gave my back to those who strike. I gave my back to those who strike, and my cheeks to those who pull out the beard. I hid not my face from disgrace and spitting, but the Lord helps me. Therefore, I've not been disgraced. Therefore, I've set my face like a flint, resolute, and I know that I shall not be put to shame. Sacrificial hope. Sacrificial hope makes the sacrifice because of the promise that gives hope. Let's talk about this. Right? Hebrews chapter 12 says this about Jesus before he went to the cross as he rode in that donkey on Palm Sunday. Right? It was the joy set before him that he endured the cross and scorned its shame. Right? There is a promise, a hope that Jesus had, a truth that Jesus knew and he held on to. And so he made a sacrifice. He made a sacrifice. I don't know if you've ever heard this said or maybe you've said this to somebody or maybe this is the first time you've heard this, but many people say this. It gets worse. It will get worse before it gets better. It's going to get worse before it gets better. It's a sacrificial hope, belief. As a counselor, as someone uh, in my ministry, right, that's something that I have to give to people a lot of times. And it's a sacrificial hope statement. Uh, this past week, I actually had an opportunity to get a physical. Um, and now I got to make a sacrificial hope thing that's very real in my life. And uh, the doctors called me up and said, Justin, guess what? You cannot eat salami and you cannot eat sausage anymore. This wouldn't be good for your health. You guys might know me around here, maybe you don't, but I love venison, and I love venison sausage. Uh, Saturday, before I was coming to church, I was really hungry. I opened up my fridge. You know what the first thing I, my eyes saw? A pound of salami. I love salami. I love wrapping it around a pickle and just chewing on that, and I love that deer sausage. Dieting. 
right, for health. You gotta make a sacrifice, right, hoping that you actually get healthier, right? That's the way it works. But sacrifice is hard, and certainly once you step into that, it's very hard, but it's gonna get easier, it's gonna get better. But I have an opportunity to talk to people who have addictions. Right? It's going to get worse before it gets better. It's going to take a lot of work. It's going to take a lot of work. Things are going to be exposed. If you have the hope to recover, it's going to get worse before it gets better. Marriages. Right? If we want to get closer to our spouse, right? it's going to get worse before it gets better. Because guess what? If you want to get closer to your spouse, you yourself need to make sacrifices. You can't call your spouse to make sacrifices. You yourself, right? selflessness. And spouses will make sacrifices, become more selfless because they have a hope to actually get stronger in their relationship. Parents, we want to be better parents. Right? Take selflessness, sacrifice. And why do we do that? Because there's hope. Right? Hope, sacrificial Hope. Sacrificial hope says, I'm going to give something up that is really good because I believe there's something greater. There's something greater. Uh, many of you guys heard me talk a couple weeks ago about basketball cards and how uh, we were, my family, we wanted to get some basketball cards. Uh, well, it was a little bit after that moment where my son and I got some leads and one of my sons made a sacrificial move and he woke up at 5.30 in the morning and he stood in line with me for an hour and a half. Not for a roller coaster, but for a pack of cards. Right? We needed to make a sacrifice to get what we were looking for. Right? Sacrificial hope. You can go ahead and take that screen down because I don't want to promote too much stuff. But <laughs> sacrificial hope. Right? James says this, and think about it this way, right? He says, uh, count it all joy, my brothers. Count it all joy, my brothers and sisters, when you meet trials of various kinds. When you're called to sacrifice through life, count it joy. For you know that the testing of your faith produces steadfastness. And when I think about that verse, oftentimes I think about it being passive, like trials are just going to come. I'm not intentionally stepping into these sacrificial moments. I'm not intentionally stepping into these trials. Trials are just happening. And that is a true statement. That happens in our lives. When I think about sacrificial hope, it's not a passive thing. It's an active thing. We're sacrificing things, stepping into it with the hope from a promise that we have that something is greater awaiting us. Promises from God. Right? In all things, he's working. He who begins a good work. We can do all things through him who gives us strength. He has a hope and a future for us. There's promises after promises after promises that call us not just to believe, but through that belief to make sacrifices. And so here's the question, right, with sacrificial hope. What are you hoping for and what are you willing to sacrifice to surrender for that hope, sacrificial hope, sacrificial love, right? Jesus sets the example here. Palm Sunday, we see him doing this. We see him going to the cross. Right? And I think about Holy Week, and I think about love and sacrificial love. Here's the question, right? Were Jesus' emotions leading him to the cross? Did Jesus' emotions, because I think a lot of times when we think of love, we think of emotions. Were his emotions leading him to the cross? Think about the Garden of Gethsemane. Right? Where were his emotions in that moment? Father, I don't want to do this. My soul is overwhelmed to the point of death. I'm terrified. I'm discouraged. Right? Look at all this stuff that's happening. These people are betraying me. They're denying me. I'm discouraged. Thank you, God, that love is way more than emotion. That love is about sacrificial obedience. And for us to understand what true love is, what true sacrificial love is, Jesus displayed it for us. Right? Obedience doesn't always flow out of emotions. Right? Emotions don't always lead to obedience. Or sacrificial love. Right? Patience. 
Right? What do we do if we don't feel like being patient? I don't feel like being patient, so what should I do about it? That's fine. I don't need to be patient then because I don't feel like it. No. Sacrificial love, because patience is part of love, sacrificial love says, yeah, I don't feel like it, but guess what? I'm going to be patient. Sacrificial love, what do I do if I don't feel like trusting somebody? If I don't feel like it, if my emotions aren't there? Sacrificial love says, yeah, I know you don't feel like it, but guess what? Just do it. I don't feel like being selfless. Okay, don't be selfless. Really? That's not sacrificial love. No, be selfless. That's sacrificial love. Typically, if you feel like doing something, that really means that you're not making a sacrifice. So sacrifice goes against the emotions. A lot of people talk about right, actions lead to attitude or the attitude leads to the actions. What's true? Right? Do our emotions lead us to being obedient to Jesus? Does being, be, being obedient to Jesus lead to the right emotions? Sacrificial love. Right? If you are waiting for another person to make a move in your life, before you make a sacrifice, that's not sacrificial love. Right? Jesus sets the example, right? Book of Romans. Why we are yet sinners, why we are yet sinners, why we are hostile towards Jesus, what did he do? He made the move. Why we are yet sinners, Christ died for us. Right? Jesus said this in the Beatitudes, and I love this, especially as we're talking about selflessness and sacrifice here, sacrificial love. Blessed are the poor in spirit. Blessed are the poor in spirit. Blessed are the humble. That's what's going on there. Blessed are the humble, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Humility. Right? And many have heard this said, humility is not thinking less of yourself. It's thinking of yourself less. Thinking of yourself less, not thinking less of yourself. Right? It's simply thinking more of others than yourself. That's sacrificial love. You know what the greatest act of sacrificial love is? Forgiving. Forgiving. Especially when you don't feel like it. It was a few weeks ago when I got the opportunity to do the children's message. Some of you guys were here. Some of you probably wish you weren't here. Especially parents who gave their kids Slurpees because of that. Um, and so we talked about grace. We talked about Slurpee as a move of grace in this past week. I was able to explain some more things in depth to our day school students specifically uh, because they went home and just told their parents, give me some Slurpees because Pastor Justin said it, and that really wasn't the point. Um, so we talked to the kids about not just receiving a Slurpee, not just receiving forgiveness from God, his sacrifice, his grace, but sharing that Slurpee with others, giving grace to others, forgiving others. That's sacrificial Love, the life of sacrifice. Many people in Jerusalem didn't get it, right? but many did. Right? He made the sacrifice and called us into a life of sacrifice. Right? The Lamb of God took away the sins of the world. It's our sins. And so today, God's asking us to saddle up on the donkey. A little humility. A little more sacrifice. Saddle up on that donkey, not because you have to to earn favor with God, but, but because you already have favor with God. It's his love that compels us. It always compels us. So may God Almighty give us more sacrificial faith, more sacrificial hope, and more sacrificial love, and may it begin right now in this moment. In Jesus' name, I say these things and I pray these things. Amen. Amen. I'm going to invite our worship team to come up at this point. Uh, there's a song on Palm Sunday, right? Certainly, we're talking about sacrifice. It's a huge move that we see there. But certainly on Palm Sunday, we just love to lift up our voices. Those who've gone before us lifted up their voices. Jesus said, right? It was recorded in Luke for us, right? Jesus said, if they don't sing, if they don't cry out, the rocks will cry out. And so we need to sing, <laughs> We need to lift up our voice, and there's a great song. A man named David Crowder wrote it. Good God Almighty, good God 
Almighty, just all the things that God has done for us. I don't know if you know this song or not, but we're going to have our worship team just lead us in this. So from your homes, from here in the sanctuary, let's just try to lift up our voices. If you're just letting this scripture, these teachings settle on your hearts and your minds too, just let it be sung. But good God Almighty, we are always going to praise you. Even in the valleys, we are going to praise you because of what you have done for us, the sacrifice that you have made. So let's give them a sacrifice of praise in this moment. 